Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. This is Chris. I'm here with Justin, and we have a very special guest on the heels of our Conception career retrospective episode. We have Conception founder and guitarist Tor Aspi on with us. Tor, welcome to the Metal Exchange. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Good to be with you, Justin and Chris. Very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of start out with the most recent um you know conception news that you guys just did a a show um just a couple of days ago how did that go oh that was a blast it was great real fun uh it was a gig in our hometown or old hometown jovic in norway uh sold out great crowd uh people flying in from seattle las vegas england belgium all over the place mixed with the local crazy maniacs it was great Great time. It's it's funny. My friend Doug had actually invited me to the show. I think he's the uh, the Seattle native that you were talking about. But I'm I'm still kicking myself for not being able to join him uh, over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, but he told me it was a fantastic time. Yeah, we had a great time. We had a lot of great time with Doug as well. Yeah, he's a he's a definitely a great guy, and um, obviously we look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple of months stateside. But I guess before we get there, let's let's go back all the way to the to the beginning. Uh, my understanding is you actually founded the band in 1989, and it would actually you'd go through a couple of different lineup changes before you got to uh, the the lineup that everybody knows uh, that you'd record with in 1991. Can you kind of describe that process of finding the right fit for the band before releasing the last sunset? Yeah. Well, I would say <clears throat> the band goes even a little further uh, back, uh, but, but Conception was definitely founded in 89. Uh, I joined like a year before, or maybe a couple years before, I joined a local band. Uh, and uh, we started to write some songs under the name Red Rum. Uh, and the singer of this band, Red Rum, like the, well, the rest of the band went to the army uh, to do their like our army duty. Uh, and it was a singer we left, and we wanted to to approach uh, more of a trash metal kind of thing. So, so, so that's where we started Conception, um, and obviously it's developed a little further from from trash metal. But but that first the first um, uh, lineup then. Um, I still met the drummer. The drummer from that lineup uh, came to the after party uh, on the show Saturday, which was really nice. Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, I have some cool photos of him and Arva together. Um, that was also actually cool when when, when we changed drummer, uh, uh, Reiner, the old drummer, he would still help us to, to complete the backdrop that we were painting at the time. Uh, so, so step by step, as conception developed, into a wider range of styles uh, then members were changed along the way and yeah in 91 that's when we finally felt now now we have the right lineup to do uh, everything we want to do and I, I my understanding is you actually recorded some demos uh, in that thrash style back in 1990 is that correct that's correct i think even someone put them up on youtube I have to track those down. I haven't heard them yet, but uh, yeah. I, I was mentioning it, I was mentioning to Chris uh, in our last episode how eager I was to hear that material. So I'll have to track that down. Yeah. Um, but eventually, the the lineup would come together, and from what I understand, the last sunset really kind of came together quickly because it was kind of recorded after about a month of rehearsals. Is that is that right? Uh, no, well, not not really, because we we spent a. Uh... We spent the time, like we did this two dem- uh, first the demo, then we did the second demo. That's mm. when, when Arva had joined. Uh, and then, then we got Inga on board. Uh, and that's where we started to record the last song. So, so we started off recording a few tracks. Uh, I think we, we started with like five or six of them. Uh, and, and it was during that recording session where we realized that the way we were heading, the, um, uh, we would need a different singer. Um, so, so, so we kind of parted ways uh, because of that. And we just continued then to, to uh, record. 
as we were searching for a new singer, and Roy Roy came into the picture probably like a month before he recorded the last sunset. So that's probably where we have your months. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess what I, what I and what I was referring to is that once the whole band uh, with Roy obviously came together, the recording with him, I guess, was was kind of quick and 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 he just laid down his tracks, and then it would be released, you know, soon thereafter. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So he didn't get to be too involved in the songwriting on that album, but he was um, definitely involved on. Can you talk? I mean, my understanding was that the entire first album was actually like self-financed, self-produced. That you did everything. You basically did everything on that album. Is that is that right? That like essentially it was the entire project was done in house. Yeah, that was do it yourself all the way. So so it was my grandmother and and Arvis, uh, the drummer's uh, aunt. I think who were actually sponsoring the whole thing, uh, and. Uh, and uh, that's so, so we booked the studio, we recorded, we had been in contact with some labels. Uh, but it was, uh, there was some interest, but, but there was always like ideas about how we should do stuff. And it was so important for us. We had all this different music that we wanted to get out there and we wanted to do that disinterrupted by anyone else. So, 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 so that was probably the main reason. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and also, and then we, we we printed, we manufactured. I remember we were sitting in the basement you know, and sending CDs all over the world, night after night after night, making press lists. You know, trying to to learn how to be a record company. Also, it was fun. Right. Yeah. Hard enough to to write the songs and record, but then to do all the business side of it had to be. Uh quite the learning experience and you were doing it, you know, as, as you know, very, very early on in your career. Yeah. No, so, but, but it felt right and it was exciting and we managed to get some underground distribution in Germany. We got some underground distribution in Japan. Then we finally had, we, from, from driving around, that's what we did first in Norway. We, we, we just took our cars and we drove from record store to record store and, and, uh, and left, left CDs on commission. Uh, and, and we contacted the press ourselves. Actually, on the last sunset, it's, it's the, the record that had the most radio airplay in Norway ever for, for us. Wow. But, but we were really focused on, on, on getting there. And then we were in some, some Norwegian charts, like the top, you know, the Norwegian top single kind of list on the radio where people vote. So, so we had a couple of songs from the last sunset sticking for, for a good while, I think one of them even reached number two. So, so, so that helped us also to, to have a lot of radio airplay. So, that's it. so that was it. That was a good start for us. What was the um, the reception um, on a more global scale? Um, did you find that you were surprised at um, you know how far it reached and how well it was received? And at that point, were, were you thinking? Um, you know, it looks like we really got something here. Um, you know, wh- where was your head at after after hearing um, the reviews and, and things of that nature around that time? Yeah, well, uh, we'll have to admit we weren't maybe the most humble guys at the time. So we, <laughs> we already thought that when the Star Trek <laughs> was so proud. But, 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 but I think, like, for me, the uh, like the highlight of feedback, that, that was one day when I got the phone call from from London. And you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have much metal shows in radio in Norway, so, so I always used to tune in on the Friday night rock show and Saturday night rock show on BBC and Radio 4. And, and there was this guy called Tommy Wams, and I've been listening to his shows for years. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, well, not nowhere because I actually didn't send him records, but he's all of a sudden on the phone and he's raving about the record. And so, so, uh, so he wants to put it on power play, and we did an interview. And, um, and he actually even had people sending in letters because they thought it was so good. So, so I, I think, we, and then he. He sent them further on to us. I think like we got like two hundred letters from UK listeners who, who were digging the album. So so that was for us like a real accomplishment. 
did you um when you were going through the recording process for that album did any songs kind of jump out at you and say to yourselves like this is what we want our sound to be like going forward and i asked that because your sound and, and the band's sound would definitely evolve over time and with each album i think that there's a different sound and i just didn't know if there was anything from that debut that you kind of saw as something that was going to carry over to parallel minds and then obviously um on the later releases as well well we never really thought so much about how it on the sound we always wrote like whatever comes to mind, what we, uh, we were going with the flow, we're doing what we feel at the moment. So, so, so there was never planned anything, but uh, we're listening back to these records. I just recently listened to them again. And uh, uh, and I can really hear on the last sense that, that trash metal thing still going on for some parts of it that, that came from from the demo era. Uh, and then, and then, of course, the last sunset being the last track that would probably show the most. Also, how it would develop. Also, with Roy on the board as a songwriter. Um, when listening back now, uh, one of my favorite tracks are "Among the Gods," uh, and that was also something that uh, we continued to use later, also in conception and even in art. This sort of mixing you know, the Spanish guitars with, with metal. Um, so, but we never like thought, okay, this is a song that we're going to, to shape our next album with anything like this. But, but I would say, I would say maybe The Last Sunset and, and Among the Gods would probably be the, the two that, uh, is most connected with the next records. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think a song like Among the Gods really, you hear elements, obviously, of later conception, but I, I hear a lot of arc in that song as well. So that was kind of what prompted the question because your your guitar playing and your style is um, very very unique, and I mean that in a good way. It's just so it's just so technically sound with the with the flamenco style and then the classical you know style at, at certain points. And, and on those two tracks, I think it really jumps out uh, early on in your in your career. Ah, thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot. It's very important for me also to be unique. I think that that is part of. I think we all want to be unique as we are as persons, and and I think that's also important as a musician. Like, that you have your own expression, and you have these things that you want to say or do with your instrument. Yeah, Yeah, I I totally, totally understood. Um, I guess as we move on into 1992 and and the recording of Parallel Minds, I guess at this point, was it was the idea obviously that you were going to write the music and that Roy wanted to kind of contribute with the lyrics because my understanding is he wrote the lyrics on on the entire disc. Yeah, and he also contributed to, to some of the the melody lines, uh, and this is something that developed more and more through through the years that he would also because today he writes so to say all the melody lines that he sings. That's also been an evolution, uh, and that's been partly that he's been more. Uh, getting into it, and probably also that I've been more loving. Because in, in the beginning, um, I had certain ideas. I remember I would sit down and, and, and write out melody lines. Uh, but then also, for example, uh, what, was, what was that song? Uh, and I closed my eyes. Uh, that's definitely not my melody line. I, re- I really remember when Roy came to the demo studio and presented that one. Uh, it was really freaking out. I loved it. So, to, to so, this, so, so, sorry, so then, go ahead. Yeah, so, so it's hard to recall exactly who wrote what on some of these tracks, melody line wise. So, so, but when we talk about it, it's more like we, we did we did it together. Uh, yeah. But he was definitely Pearl Mines was then also written with Roy in mind, which also is uh, an important thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's funny you you bring up and I close my eyes and and. W- even though obviously your thumbprint is all over the album, the, the vocal melodies, especially during the chorus, you can tell that Roy kind of added his own thing there because it's just so remarkable. And the way he sings that is, um, it's incredible. I, I, to this day, don't know how he's able to, to sing like that. It's, it's, it's one of a kind. Oh, here's amazing. 
Um, my understanding was that when you uh, were were kind of laying that whole album out, even though it would have the the ten main songs, that you actually had multiple albums worth of material written for the for the album. Are are those tracks kind of? Is there ever going to be a release of those kind of like B sides and demos, or is that kind of stuff just archived away at this point, and and you, then you would move on to later albums? Well, the good thing is that they've been archived because we did demo a lot of stuff. So, um, so uh, I, I can't talk too much about it now, but I can tell you that we have been listening through. And, Excellent. And yeah, and I think we'll we'll share some of this later. Looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that for for Chris and I, our first uh, exposure. Uh, to the band was, was Parallel Minds. Now we didn't hear it in 1993. We would actually hear it a couple of years later in 1997. Uh, but we both heard that was our first exposure to the band and we were just blown away because I think that the songwriting and the direction of the band would really kind of set the stage here because, uh, although it's had some of those faster tracks, you know, obviously, um, you know, water confines and roll the fire to a, to a lesser extent. Uh, you can hear the progression in the songwriting from last sunset to parallel minds. It just, uh, there's a more maturity there with some of the, so- I think with some of the songwriting. Yeah. No, but most definitely. Uh, and we were quite young at the time. Uh, so we were 19 when we did last sunset. So there's a, there's a lot happening. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't really played our instruments for that long either when, when we did the last sunset. So so those two years in between, that, that, that's a very long time for us then, uh, musically-wise, and uh, developing. Uh, and I think also for me, between last sunset and Parallel Minds, for, from, from my guitar point of view, I also had discovered David Gilmore, Pink Floyd. Uh, and obviously, a song like Soliloquy is very inspired by him and Pink Floyd. Um, and that was for me also a revelation because uh, I've been into lots of these shredder guitarists, Mel Demiola, and, this, and Paco de Lucia. Uh, but, um, but then all of a sudden, uh, I hear this guitarist who, can, who, with one note, can play or can express himself more than, than a shredder can do in a million notes. So, so, so that was uh, that was also a little uh, part of that progress for me. And then, you know, being better at the craft, the songwriting, maybe. I still think we uh, it, it's cool that we did it the way we did in the last sunset, but we definitely became better to to arrange our, our tracks and uh, and put the songs a little better together. Um, I I told the story on the um the previous episode of the podcast about the very first time I heard Conception was um, a friend of mine left their book of CDs um in at my house and. I popped in the parallel minds and the first thing I heard was this, this song water confines and it absolutely just blew my, my socks off. Um, the, the way that that track just starts out with just so much, so much energy and so much like excitement. And, um, I mean, did you, did you just know like, this is the song that, that we need to start this album with just to get, just to get this thing running you know real hot right from the beginning because i mean to this day whenever i hear that song it just gets me so amped up it's just such a it's such a just i don't even know how to explain it like i i was telling justin it would make like a great like song to put on when you're in the gym or you're gonna go for a run or you just need like a little bit of energy um even after all these years like i can still put that song on and just gets me so excited I'm so cool, so cool to hear that. Uh, it's uh, I'm absolutely. I, I, mean, I think we were also quite into that. Uh, we should start the album with something really energetic. Uh, I really like that song too. Uh, maybe some, maybe it's a track to consider to put back on our set list later. It's a, uh, it's really that would, cool. One. I was gonna say. I mean, if you wanted to play it at Prague Power in Atlanta, uh, we wouldn't be upset with you if you made that choice. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. How did you um? How did you select Tommy Newton as the producer on this album? Because he's had his hands in a lot of uh, 
classic stuff. We Chris and I happen to be big Halloween fans, and I know he did a lot of work with them as well. How did you choose Tommy Newton as the producer? That was through the record company. So so we signed with Noise for for Parallel Minds, and yep. uh, and they came up with some suggestions, and then we talked to them, and then the final decision landed on on Newton. So, and. So this would also be, I guess, the first time you would experiment with doing a music video, which you did for Roll the Fire. Why did you choose that song as, as kind of the, the representative single and music video for the album? I think that's, that, that's what we felt then was what really represented us uh, as who we were. Uh, so we felt it was a strong song. We felt it had uh, also the various elements. Or the atmospheres, the, the riffy grooves, uh, also a little bit uh, progressive elements with the intro, outro. Uh, so, no, so, so, so that felt like for us to be, what I think was like that one in Silent Crying felt. So with, with Parallel Minds, you know, being uh, almost 30 years old, uh, you know, we'll celebrate the anniversary uh, next year. Are there any tracks that kind of jump out at you as some of the more memorable tracks on the album? I know that some of these songs remain, uh, you know, in your live set list. And obviously you would do a, a new version of Roll the Fire, which, which came out. We'll, we'll talk about the, the re, the re-release of State of Deception, uh, a little bit later. But are there any tracks from, from Parallel Minds that kind of jump out at you as, as some of your personal favorites? Well, I just recently listened through the album uh, again and heard it for a long, long time. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the diversity of all the tracks. Um, uh, but there's maybe, yeah, maybe some songs that sticks out for me, like Soliloquy, uh, like Roll the Fire and Silent Crying that we, we're still having on our set list. Uh, Silver Shine uh, was a very, very nice one. I, I like that they're so different. That they, they have all their the 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 different vibes. So 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 uh, I like them all. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 definitely a diverse album, which would kind of be a hallmark of all of the the more recent, if you will, conception albums. And I I use that term, you know, kind of loosely because some of these albums that we're talking about are 25 and 30 years old but when you go through the the catalog the you can hear the diversity uh in the material um and and before you would go into the studio and record in your multitude you would be on uh the power of metal um i will call it a compilation live album with some other bands like gamma ray and rage what was that experience like and and how did noise records kind of approach you to 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 play live at this like showcase festival oh it was so exciting for us so it was such exciting times we, uh, we had just signed with noise uh like we talked about they, they put us up with tommy newton as producer we went to germany to record uh and in the midst of recording this album that, that's when um they also asked if it, or that was probably planned before we started but uh, at least in the middle of the recordings we um, we then headed out for this tour, and, and it was the first time we played outside Norway. Uh, and this whole experience was uh, mind blowing for us. We had such a great time, so exciting. And I guess it was after that that you really kind of played some, like you said, live shows outside of Norway, and and you would get back in the studio uh, in 1995 to record in your multitude. And to my ears, this is kind of your, uh, uh, kind of a pivotal moment in the band's tenure because the sound on the album was kind of, at least to me, a little bit more akin to the flow material and some of the more recent material, uh, and, and kind of drifting away from the, the thrashiness of, of, of the last sunset. Um, was that a conscious decision or was that just kind of what your influences were at the time when, when you and, and, um, you know, Ingar and, and, and Arv and, and, and Roy were kind of just like, you know, gravitating towards a, a little bit of a different style. I think it was a natural development. We, we never really been conscious that we want to sound like this or sound like that. So, so, so it was most definitely just natural progression for us. Uh, uh, and you know, looking back to, to on older older albums, 
that's that's always been like this. This is in our DNA. We 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 constantly need to evolve and express something new. Um, so no, so that that felt natural, uh, and some maybe some elements we took even further, like the progressive elements and um, and like the jazz fusion elements on a million gods. I don't know where all the gods come from among the gods. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a pattern with the with some of the song titles. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Have to ask Roy about that. Uh, <laughs> so so. Um, uh, and, and that's also that's my uh, one of my live favorites today. Uh, Million Gods is so exciting to play, and I think it's also it's got so much energy. Uh, like we talked about, Water Confines. This one has for me also. It's probably because I have to play, play a billion notes. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's. I, I think it's one of your more uh, quote unquote progressive tunes, but yet it's still so catchy and heavy. Um, Definitely a, a crowd favorite and, and something that I think we've been lucky to uh, to see live. I remember when you played it uh, in Atlanta in 2005. I, I couldn't believe that it was selected because I just, you know, and I, I will touch upon that, I guess, towards the end. But I'll just say from, from the fan perspective, um, I had no idea what you were going to play at that festival because when you kind of got back together – um, you know, there was nothing to base it off of. We didn't know what you were going to play. And then you played A Million Gods and I, I could not believe it. It was it was one of the songs that um, I think I was most surprised to hear live, but it holds up very well. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Oh, like I said, it's so fun to play. Uh, and, and I think uh, and that's been so cool now recently also because there, there's a, a further element of groove to it now, the, the way we play today than, than we did in 95. So, so uh, no, it's a very exciting track. One of the other questions I had, and it, I think it's kind of a good good point to, to talk about it. Um, some of these albums are exceptionally difficult to find um, CD or hard copies of. I, I happen to own them. I got them, you know, many, 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 many years ago. Uh, but is there is there um, a discussion about potentially re-releasing some of this material or even releasing it on digital platforms? Because I know that... Um, uh, some people had reached out to us and they were interested in listening to some of this material, but they couldn't find it. And, and it wasn't on, you know, some people use Spotify, other people want the CDs, but they, they were having difficulty kind of accessing some of these older albums. And yeah, no, it's been really frustrating for us as well. I mean, we, we put our hearts and soul into these albums and we're proud of them and that they couldn't be shared for, for such a long time, the, 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 that's been a drag. So, so, so we've been trying for, for some while to, to, to do something about this, but these are rights that fell out of our hands. And when noise, noise was sold to Sanctuary, Sanctuary was sold to Universal, Universal sold the whole catalog to BMG. But we are in dialogue with BMG and there are, there are plans now finally for re-releasing. So, uh, it's, it's gonna happen. Fantastic! I, I think that will make a lot of um, a lot of fans and a lot of kind of newer fans that may have started with uh, either State of Deception or or even the the My Dark Symphony EP that want to kind of go back into the archives a bit. Um, I'm sure that will be uh, a very welcomed um, addition to their collections once once this stuff is accessible again. Hey, my, myself included. I, I I still am missing Conception albums that I want to have in my collection. So. Um... I think I even said on the pot, on the previous episode, uh, so, as soon as those albums are released, I'll be buying them immediately. Great, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, how, how was the reception to, to "In Your Multitude"? And did you feel that um, that essentially that you guys were kind of taking the next step as a band? Because uh, as you would kind of move on to you know 1997 and the recording of flow i feel like that's when the band really kind of took the next step not only in terms of songwriting but in terms of just worldwide popularity yeah well um there were certain things that happened around in your multitude the, the guy who signed us who used to own the noise label he sold it and and uh, so so there was um a little different personnel with 
We didn't get to tour as much on any multitude as we did on Peril Mines. We were a little disappointed of that and um, a little frustrated, I remember. So, so we, we really wanted to get out more. So, so it felt like we felt like we had progressed musically, but we, we, did, we, we felt at the time also that we stood a little bit still in our career development, so to speak. So. Yeah, that, I guess that makes sense because you hear you release this great album, but if people don't get to hear it live, it's kind of hard to get that you know machine behind it to really have people buy CDs or merchandise or whatever the case may be in the in the mid '90s. And this is obviously pre-internet, where people can't just go and 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 you know listen to songs on on online or anything like that. So it was obviously a very different time in the industry. Yeah, no, it was most definitely. Uh, uh, but, but I think also the live experience is also such an important part of it. Uh, and, uh, of course we, we got to do some, some, uh, shows and uh, some, we did a small tour of Japan. We, uh, we played some festival and, um, uh, and, and did some stuff, but, but we were so eager to do more. But as that didn't happen, then, then we went, uh, then we went back to, to write new material. And because you were mentioning flow, and then, uh, again, there wasn't any like, okay, let's write like this or that. But, uh, I think what I can also say, cause, um, after Any Multitude, uh, I also started to work with John McAluso that you had on your show the, uh, the other week, I heard. Uh, and, uh, when I started starting playing f- with him, it felt like a natural thing to to go further from you know a million gods that style kind of playing uh, and explore that with him as we were exploring other territories with conception. So, so, so there would also be two different things. And, uh, and at the time, uh, I was thinking of, of Arcton to be more some kind of a playground side project uh, where we could just do all kind of crazy stuff and, and, and focus conception more on, on the uh, melodic songwriting. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, so this was worked a little parallel, uh, uh, like arc and, and the flow record. Um, but before we, uh, move off, move, uh, move along from in your multitude, I, I just wanted to, to quickly ask, um, I, I think most people would say that In Your Multitude has the most interesting uh, album art of any of the Conception releases. I, I was just curious where the album art was inspired from and where it, it's very, uh, it's it's just very kind of tribal and interesting. I thought yeah. maybe you could share a few thoughts on that. Yeah, no, for, for us, uh, we wanted, uh, you know, something to to show the multitude. Uh, and, uh, and so, so, so we were excited to, uh, then to see there, there was a tribal person from a complete different culture. Uh, and, uh, so, so, so I think it's more like, yeah, show, show diversity, show, so, uh, uh, it's more or less our, what, what was our wish. And then the record company, they, they were in touch with this artist. This, this cover, uh, artwork also, uh, I was a little freaked out about it actually when just a few years ago someone uh, showed me a photo that quite looks quite the same as this. Hmm. That was a, a Nazi photographer who who had uh, taken uh, a photo like this, or, or someone who worked for the Nazi regime. So I was so wow. really scared that, that we would be associated with those kind of thoughts because our 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 values has always been that everyone's equal doesn't matter color culture sex orientation uh, we're all the same uh, so, so that freaked me out actually a little bit to see that photo that was uh, so so similar but but for yeah, us, I, definitely it's all about diversity yeah I, I can imagine that that had to be startling to say the least um I, I know that michael albers i guess had done the cover art he did parallel minds uh as well, I think he did uh, the last Sunday set as well. So I guess you had been working with him for years, but uh, definitely um, a striking uh, cover for for in your multitude. Whereas flow would be a little bit more subdued, and you'd go kind of in a different direction because it was obviously very very. Uh, <laughs> 
green, for lack of a better word. It would, that, that would be the first time that you'd employ uh, Asgard Mikkelsen. Is that how you say that? Yeah. Oscar Mikkelsen. Uh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And and it felt also like Flo headed into a more futuristic kind of style. Absolutely. So so uh, so as in the multitude was more connected to a roots, uh, Flo was more connected to uh, what should I say? Well, well, what we would feel is to come. That makes sense and I'll, I'll say this the um the songwriting for flow i think is some of just your absolute best work i happen to be a like arc fanatic so for me i can just imagine the ideas that were coming out around this time with both john macaluso on the one side the conception guys on the other side uh just lots of ideas and i guess it was almost a matter of where where some of these uh, guitar and, and melodies belonged, right? Because uh, Flow, more than any other album, I think has just very, very catchy, catchy melodies, but it has that quirkiness to it that really keeps it interesting, which is the same thing you could say for a lot of the arc material as well. It's quirky, but very, very catchy and melodic, uh, just the same. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, and I think it's important also, even if the, even if the music can be a little complicated, uh, you should be able always to tap your foot and, and there should be, uh, you know, you should, you should have a sense of groove. Uh, that's the importance. Uh, and how it swings or what kind of groove doesn't really matter. But if it's so technical that, that you lose uh, those aspects, then, then, um, then I lose interest. But, uh, um, uh, and also, like, melodic, there are songs, it's just that they're inconventionally arranged, um, and and I, and I never thought that music should be, you know, sitting between four squares, so this is loud and this is not. Um, so, so it's always been good to, uh, to, to be able to, to work outside these kind of frames and not really pay too much attention to them, even though I have to admit that most of our songs have some kind of a, a typical arrangement to them. It feels natural, uh, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what I really wanted to say here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it sounded good. Yeah. Um, at, so, so the next time there would be conception material would be over twenty years after this. So, my question is: while you were recording this album. Did you did you and the guys have any idea that this was kind of the the going to be the end of the band for a while, or is that something that developed after the album was released? Um, I, I don't know because I, I know that you know Roy was in was on a Camelot album the, the very next year, um, and you know Ark would be what year did the first Ark album come out? Justin ninety came out ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, so that's when it um, came out. we actually recorded the music to it back. I think 96, 95, 96. Oh, wow. Okay. So di- did you guys have an idea that this might be it for a while? Or, or did that, again, like, did that, was that something that came after the album was released? Yeah, well, I mentioned to you guys that uh, we were a little, you know, disappointed that we didn't get to tour that much within a multitude. And then, then we did the flow. Uh, and again, we were super excited and happy about how the record come about, the songs came about. Uh, but again, um, the touring situation uh, was frustrating us. And and finally, we were supposed to be on a two-month triple bill tour with Stratuarius and LG. Uh, and then we were super excited. Finally, we're getting back to tour for real. And I think it was only two weeks prior to the first date of that tour. Um we we were in the middle of rehearsing to to prepare for that tour when we just got a phone call that you guys are off the tour. Oh. So that was so frustrating. And I, and I remember after that, me and Roy, we used to sit in our rehearsal room and writing new material. We wrote a few new songs, but we really, really struggled to, to find inspiration. Uh, we ended up playing more cards than than work on music, uh, and that, that's where we, we realized that okay, now we're in a situation where we're, we're forcing music 
that's not right. So, so and, and Ingar, at the same time, he had this, uh, you know, love for black metal and ideas to, to do the Crest of Darkness stuff. So as we were talking, and then I just realized, we, we sat down, all the four of us, and it's better we take a break, because we really don't want to force anything. Music has to flow by itself. It has to come. There must be something you want to do. If not, it's useless. It's it's like the age-old story of, of the, the industry and the and kind of the circumstances outside the band that kind of led to the ultimate, you know, the, the, the break, if you will, just because circumstances outside of your control kind of took over and, and just led it to a, to the, to its ultimate end before it would be, uh, before it would come back stronger than ever. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, so there was the, these unfortunate events and yeah, I know we, we got a little fed up and then of course I had arc and, uh, and, uh, to remember if you already had Jorn in place, then if that was a little later. Uh, so, uh, no, so, so, so anyhow, it felt like uh, it felt like the right thing to do, but we never we had no idea that the break was going to be that long. Right, right, and I guess that was you know kind of the next question. You release this great album. Circumstances kind of take you off of that European tour. What happened in 2005 that kind of got everybody back together to play those handful of shows? Well, you know, we we always saw each other because because we would still be friends. Actually, I saw more of Roy there for for a while uh, after we we took that break than I ever did because because we um uh, we were living together in a, in a house in Oslo in a small community there uh, where we also would have. You know, Camelot guys would come over and stay with us, or art guys would come over and stay with us. So, so we, we you know, we were still tightly connected. Uh, and heading up to see Arvin Ingar in uh, where they live from time to time as well. So, so I don't remember exactly why it happened in 2005. It was just a natural thing, I think. We were, we had been jamming a little bit and, and I don't remember if it was because it could have, it could actually very well be because of prog power, uh, uh, and that Glenn wanted us to come, and uh, that might have been the trigger that it happened then. Yeah. Well, uh, um, whatever whatever it was, and and I'll have to buy Glenn a beer if that's the case. It got you guys, you know. You pl- I think you played a couple of shows in Norway. You came down to Atlanta and played here. Uh, was there any discussion at that time of, of going back into the studio and creating some new music? Because obviously, uh, you know, it would be another decade or so before um, before we heard any new material. Well, we, we had actually done some songwriting in 2000. I found some old discs where, where we jam from... I mean, with Roy, I've been writing all along. Uh, we wrote a bunch of other stuff that we'll see if we do something about that one day. But that's definitely not conception material. That's something completely different. But uh, but then I, then I found these conception jams. Uh, and actually, uh, what's it called? Uh, she Dragoon from A State of Deception. Uh, that's actually based on something I jammed out with Arve in his basement back in 2002. Wow. Or, or the basic riffs, uh, and then we added to to that track later when we, we took it back up. So, so but but about the time in two thousand five, um, I I don't think we uh, we even talked much about new songs. We were on this if 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 things would uh, start to roll songwriting wise, we would probably have started to write, but. Uh, as far as I remember, uh, the whole focus was there and then on, on doing these shows. And, and can you talk a little bit about your memories of, of, of the show in Atlanta? Just because a lot of the people that listen um, are patrons of the festival and, and you know, have uh, long time, long time supporters of the fest who may even remember that show like myself. Um, what was your what was your uh, memories of, of playing in the United States for the first time and, uh, and obviously playing that festival? Oh, that that was amazing, uh, and all all of us were were you know freaking out with excitement to to do this show, uh, and I had been there once before with Ark, so I kind of knew the vibe. Right. I have to say, I love that vibe. Prog Power is a very very special 
uh, special festival. And I love this thing because, you know, when you play and, and you go out to see the audience and hang with the audience, sometimes the audience can be a little uptight because they see in a certain way. Uh, what I really love about Prog Power is that the audience and us as artists, we're all there just because of one reason. We love music. So, so, so I enjoyed myself so much just walking around, talking to people, uh, just being a part of the crowd. It felt so natural with it, with everyone. So, so fantastic festival. Uh, and, and it was so hospitable to us. Isn't that what you say? Hospital? Uh, yeah, hospitable. Yes. Uh, hospitable. Yeah. Uh, Glenn was a little too much because he would stand in front of stage with a bottle of whiskey and a bass player. He didn't know how to, to handle that. So, so he got so drunk towards the end. I think that's all the only time I've seen him drunk on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Good, <laughs> good, good, good times. Uh, I, I remember it fondly. Um, you know, after that show, which was obviously very, very memorable from the fan perspective, you know, there would be a, a relatively long hiatus and then these pictures would surface on the internet and the rumors would obviously start swirling in 2018 that the band was getting back together. And I think there were even videos of people walking by and hearing music from a, a rehearsal space. Um, what was the, what, what inspired the, the reunion, if you will, in 2018 and obviously the recording of uh, the My Dark Symphony EP? Well, I think what sparked it was that I hadn't seen Arva for a while. And then we, uh, we uh, started to, to jam a little. Uh, and, uh, and then I had a couple of tracks also that I, written that, that I, got, I got this conception vibe from. So, so, so I checked them out with Arva first. Uh, and then we jammed out some other stuff. And we really, we really uh, hit it off, and um, so so then, Arvi went back to talk to Ingar, uh, and uh, and I met up with Roy, and then I played him a couple of tracks, uh, uh, and uh, he really liked it, and that's where we don't you know if, like start. Um, maybe we should uh, look into to doing some songwriting, and and uh, then we ended up with me and Roy going up uh, a week in the mountains, and. And it all started to flow real. So, so we wrote so much in a week. That's such a great time. It was so inspiring. Uh, and that's that's where we, we knew for sure that now is the time to 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 really create music again. And uh, we're very very lucky to have that. Uh, State of Deception would obviously come out in uh, April of 2020, and I actually read, read earlier today that the deluxe edition is, a, I think, due out next month, where there'll be a bonus disc with uh, some of the live singles, obviously um, the the new song Monument in Time. Can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect from the from the re release of of the new album? Yeah, you also have actually uh, one one of the. That was probably the first track I played for Roy when I met him, and it wasn't really back when uh, after I had this uh, jams with Arva. Uh, was uh, a song I'd written for my daughter on the ukulele for mm. Matilda. Um, uh, it was like a lullaby, uh, and Roy loved it so much. Uh, uh, and finally, like you can, yeah, let's do it in conception. Now ah, well, I gave it to my daughter. You know, it's hers. So, yeah, that's so great. Come on, man. Okay, so so finally <laughs> he did huh. he did it the well delights and so 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 that will be on your own lullaby so that that'll be on the deluxe so awesome so so with the monument that's the two completely new songs uh, and then of course the uh, the new and modernized versions of roll the fire and silent crying which were done in a different way now uh, and yeah I think it's six tracks from our our first shows then in Jövik back in 1990. So, so uh, and, and those, those two shows had such a special vibe also. Uh, we hadn't been on stage together since 2005. Uh, and all the excitement of being back on stage and the excitement of playing in this intimate place with people from all over the world. We had our own little prog power. You know, prog power, you know, have all people from all over, or first and foremost, the States. It felt a little bit the same. It's just a big bunch of happy people from all over the world. Hmm. It was great. 
So yeah, so so we're very excited about that. Then then we have the instrumental versions also um, from from the original album, State of Deception, uh, and it's a double purpose with that. The one is we do have a lot of detail in in our productions. Uh, so so it's for those who want to sit and listen to the music as a standalone and, and, and hear more of these details, you can do that. Or if those, uh, or for those who want to be uh, Roy and sing, sing their throat out, <laughs> uh, sing with album. So it could be used as a karaoke kind of thing as well. Nice. Um, I, I was curious um, when when the band got back together in, in 2018 and released, you know, the EP and then the the follow up album, State of Deception. Was there anything that was like left over from the the olden days of conception that um, maybe you still had written down or in your head that you wanted to kind of use in, in this new era of conception. And if not, um, is that something that maybe might happen in the future where um, maybe some stuff that, that you had written back in the day that never made it um, onto a disc or, or, you know, made it out there might, um, you know, reappear. Well, it's, uh, it's more like, uh, what we have, what we did back then, uh, maybe one day we would, we, would, we would do some more, you know, like we did with Roll the Fire and Sound Crying and, and make some old tunes in a new kind of setting. Uh, uh, and it could be, for example, that we would do, do something like that with a song like Where Roses Fade. You know, we, we, we released this demo from 1992. It's all on cassette only, uh, and um, um, uh, and it was, well, it's actually not released now. But we remastered it, so so it's, it's on pre-sale right now. Uh, mm. And that's maybe a track that we could do something with. But but I think for us, it's always about moving forward, not going back, but being proud of what we've done. Uh, and, and it's all you know. It felt. Uh, all, everything we did, those unreleased material, also was special to us in a way. So, 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 so it's more like we'll we'll probably release more of our old demos that never made it to uh, to the record, and then think forward. But the oldest thing that was on on the 2018 or uh, and and 20 recordings now um, that is uh, uh, Feather Moves. Because that was the music, something I wrote. I, I used to live in in southern France in the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and I wrote that, uh, the, only the music. The, and, and, then, uh, and then that also, I, I did play it for Roy back then. Nothing happened. And then when we went back to that cottage for, up in the mountains I was talking about, uh, and I played it again. All of a sudden, uh, the whole tune came to him, like vocal wise. So, so mm. you could say that that's also a step back. It's, uh, but that's been sitting there and it's just been waiting, you know, to be completed. It's like French wine. <laughs> French <laughs> gets better with age, right? The, the, as as it kind of as, as it ages, it gets only better when we hear it you know, almost twenty years later. <laughs> exactly, and it took it took. Well, I think it took almost twenty years to develop, so so it would be ready for uh, production. I almost said, ready to be bottled. <laughs> <up. laughs> That's great. Um, and I guess I'll ask you the other the other side of the coin is, you know, now that you're you're obviously playing live again, you played last week, and you have um, shows on the horizon. Can you talk a little bit about what the future plans uh, for the band are, and and kind of what we can expect down the line from from conception? Yeah. Well. It has been very intense years now for us because because we're back to do it yourself. We run our own record company. Uh, well, we have employed a guy in England who, who is doing most of that work, but it's still a lot of work for us. Uh, and running this whole business, uh, and we also had some challenges with um, first pledge going uh, bankrupt, and then uh, and then the pandemic that hit just when we released State of Deception. We're going to choose a different uh, album title next time. Uh, more like State of Happiness or whatever. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that really, that really 
<laughs> little, little Inception, ching, ching. Conception presents everything's fine. Yeah, that's gonna be that, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> Well, so, uh, so, so it's been challenging for us and, and we have spent a lot of time, you know, writing and, and uh, when we do the productions, we, we don't just do the productions left-handed. We, we, we work a lot on the details. Uh, so, so right now for us, it's, um, what's good now. Finally, we can start touring and we've been waiting so much to, to get back on stage. Uh, and, and now we want to do State of Deception just, uh, and, and the My Dark Symphony as well. We kind of will be touring them both. I see, I see them kind of as a, as a double release linked to each other. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, so, so now we'll, we'll focus on playing live, um, and, uh, I'll be, or, uh, I have started to, to write a bunch of other music that I will look into. Roy is the same. And I think now focus on, on, on playing live with this. And we have the European tour next year. Uh, and then step by step, then, then we'll, we'll take the next, uh, steps probably. So. And we always been like this. We, we always take one step at a time. First it was the EP, then it was to play, then it was the, the album, then again now to play, and now with the looks in between. We can't wait to be on the stage and, and have a little focus on that side of it. We can't wait to see you on the stage. We're, we're so excited for uh, Prague Power USA. is just uh, just shy of it's uh, two months away. Yeah. Um, we're... we're you know, we're a long time, uh, long time attendees. Um, but I, you know, I wasn't there the last time conception played. Justin was there. And, um, so this is going to be my first time seeing conception live. It's going to be my first time hearing Roy sing live. It's going to be my first time seeing you play guitar live. So, um, I'm really, really excited. Uh, uh, do you guys talk about, um, playing different songs in different places because you think that maybe a certain song might might go over better depending on the audience. Like maybe Americans might like this song better than than Norwegians or something like that. And and basically, I'm just asking if we're going to get anything special <laughs> at, at Prague Power. Um, just I'm just curious, but uh, feel well, free to to share whatever you feel comfortable uh, with. Well, if if you were to get anything special, I wouldn't say. Then it would be more of a surprise. Um, but sure. yeah. we'll see. Uh, and it's also like, uh, for us now, you know, this whole pandemic, because uh, I live in Sweden, the rest of the guys in Norway, the, the board has been shut. So, and, and it's just recently that we could start rehearse again uh, together. So, it's just, we haven't played together now for a year and a half almost. Uh, and we had two rehearsal sessions just before this. So, but, but we'll, we'll definitely look into whether we're going to change set list a little bit. But um, right now, we've just been focused on the Jövik gig and uh, and Stockholm. That's the twenty third of April and also the twenty ninth. Uh, and then um, we might have some time to to adjust, uh, or we might not. So, uh, well, we'll see. Look forward, looking forward to it uh, either way. Yeah. Um, we want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, we look forward to obviously seeing you live in a couple of months and, and for what the uh, future of Conception holds. But um, either way, we just want to thank you so much uh, for joining us and for kind of taking a trip down memory lane, if you will, going back to some of this material, which you may not have talked about for, for some time. Well, it's been a great pleasure been a great pleasure to talk to both of you and uh, we're so looking forward to see you and everybody else at Prog Power. It's gonna be a blast. We uh, we cannot wait. Thank you, Tor. We will speak to you soon. Talk yes, to you. much. Take care, guys. Much appreciated. <laughs>